thank you very much. I'm not sure about the professional tag. Um, thank you very much. I chose as my title, The Most Dangerous and Deadly Illusion is to Underestimate Fundamentalism. And that's what I wanted to try and speak to. Um, at the launch of the Women Against Fundamentalism book, Stories of Dissent and Solidarity, last year, someone said to me, you must feel really vindicated. WAF, Women Against Fundamentalism, predicted the rise of religious fundamentalism all those years ago, but no one paid much attention. Of course, we can take no pleasure in being right about our predictions about religious fundamentalism, and in any case, even back then, I don't think any of us could have predict predicted the extent of the rise of religious political movements and the violence and atrocities that have followed globally. We speak in the shadow of a litany of unspeakable horrors. The recent massacre of what were mainly radical left-leaning journalists in Paris and the no less shocking acts of religious extremist violence, murder and genocide committed by religious political extremists in Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, India and elsewhere. And they've been committed on the majority of people who are civilians and who are from the same religion as the perpetrators who speak in their name and in the name of religion. The list of such atrocities is endless, but so is the underestimation of religious fundamentalism, especially by many on the left. So I stand here actually feeling bookended by two events. Sorry. Um, the Rushdie affair in 1989 and the Charlie Hebdo affair in January 2015. What both the Rushdie and the Charlie Hebdo events have in common is the struggle for free speech and the right to dissent. In the UK, the Rushdie affair was actually my initi initiation to the politics of religious fundamentalism and to the politics of resistance to fundamentalism, a resistance that developed with the passage of time and eventually stalled, but which at its highest point did not compromise on challenging racism and imperialism and religious fundamentalism. WAF's guiding mantra was that both struggles have to be waged at one and the same time, since they are each other's environment. And whilst we were at pains to point out that free speech does have limits, when it becomes incitement to hatred and violence, for instance, the demand for the extension of blasphemy laws, which has historically privileged Christianity in the UK, was not one of those limits. We also made the point that free speech was not just a liberal, but a feminist issue. Since the right to dissent from patriarchal, religious, and cultural orthodoxies has always been an important part of the feminist armory. Our analysis showed how the real losers of the emergence of religious, cultural, and politics of so-called causing offense which has created the fallacious idea of the right to be offended, were women, sexual minorities, and other religious minorities, more often than not from within the same communities. And so it has proved to be. Those who are targeted are those who dare to show irreverence or question and criticize religion. From the furor surrounding the staging of the Bestie play in 2005, which according to Sikh fundamentalists, offended Sikh sensibilities, to the pulling of the MF Hussein exhibition in London in 2006, following protests by Hindu fundamentalists who claimed to be acting on behalf of all Hindus similarly offended, and to the presence of vigilante groups of young Muslim men linked to Muslim fundamentalist movements in East London, who have become self-appointed guardians of community morality. What we see is Hindu, Sikh, Muslim fundamentalists have all mobilized, campaigned, and protested aggressively, and even violently. And in doing so, they blur the di distinction between protest and intimidation, which is deliberately used to terrorize and censor democratic debate. So what I think we're grappling with 
And what we learned very early on is that religious fundamentalism has little or nothing to do with religion. It is about power and politics. It's about the use of violence to suppress alternative ideas and any form of dissent from religious orthodoxies. It glorifies criminality and disguises it as a fight for a just cause, even as a defense of human rights. It uses violence to destroy free, open, democratic societies that are created out of struggles for accountability whenever and wherever power is exercised by individuals and institutions. The end game of all religious fundamentalism is hatred and intolerance, silence and violence. It leads to the destruction of aspirations, hopes and efforts to be better human beings. It aims to destroy our capacity to imagine what justice and equality might look like. Ideas that should be, to borrow the title of an article by the Indian historian Lilip Simeon, the music of humanity. Much in the same way that it was argued that Rushdie was provocative and caused religious offense and contributed to the stereotyping of an entire Muslim population as backward, barbaric, and med medieval, there are many who see themselves as anti-racist and part of a broad left who today similarly argue that Charlie Hebdo caused religious offense and contributed to stereotypes of Muslims that fed into a very racist and intolerant French establishment culture in which many Muslims live as the underclass, subjected to lifelong deprivation, criminality, and alienation. Further, it is argued that what occurred was not satire, since it involved the powerful insulting the powerless. These are some of the dominant themes that have emerged in much anti-racist left commentary and were forcefully echoed in a recently packed meeting at SOAS to which I was invited to discuss the work and politics of South or Black Sisters. I think the reality of ghettos, of deprivation, of racism, humiliation, alienation suffered by many immigrants, non-immigrants, Muslims and non-Muslims in France and in other parts of the world, uh, Europe do deserve political analysis <coughs> and resistance of which there is a rich history in the UK and elsewhere in Europe. SBS grapples with the impact of institutionalized racism every day as we witness how inhumane anti-immigration measures divide families, creating death, fear, destitution, homelessness, and mental health breakdown in minority communities, how black African women are criminalized by the police for defending themselves against domestic violence, and how Asian women's struggles against forced marriage and honor-based violence um, are abused by the Home Office to serve its own narrow political agenda on so-called integration, by which we can read assimilation and border control. So although here, even here, as we talk about institutionalized racism and other forms of racist brutality, we would be only telling half the story if we didn't also acknowledge the fact of communalism and prejudice in our own minority communities. These are urgent matters that require us to mobilize and campaign against, sometimes actually with considerable humor, for without it we can't get through the painful realities of everyday life. But what is, urgently, what, what is also urgently required is the need to grasp and accept the fact that the story of Charlie Hebdo starts not with the racist context of the, or the aftermath of the brutal killings, but the killings themselves, which are the product of a religious far-right ideology that is nihilistic and no different from fascism. It is not possible to justify without loss of integrity that such killings are the consequence of the dispossessed and the disenfranchised. Try telling that to the parents of the hundreds of children who were murdered in Pakistan, or to the parents of the children who have been abducted and killed in Nigeria. Nor does it explain the fact that religious fundamentalist movements have also attracted the well-integrated, the, the middle class, and the educated. Despite the most gruesome acts of depravity, criminality, and brutality, many on the left 
endlessly peddle the view that Charlie Hebdo is a racist, is racist and Islamophobic. And I actually think it's a pervasive misconception that has taken hold amongst the left, like some collective sickness. And that the, actually many of the journalists in Charlie Hebdo were left-leaning, were trade unionists, were part of the Communist Party, and so on, and have rich traditions in fighting racism in France and anti-immigration policies and other things. The argument that these terrorists were mainly, were merely the victims of the war on terror or of French state intolerance and racism and Islamophobia and Western imperialism is fallacious. It is as if the left, it is as if many on the left are simply incapable of examining the brutality of religious terrorism in any other way except through the so-called anti-racist lens that seeks to embrace, deny, minimize, apologize, or underestimate the threat posed by all religious fundamentalist movements that are both global spanning and context specific. In fact, what we're witness to is a construction of a new form of anti-racism, a religious-based anti-racism, centered around the pernicious politics of the right to be offended. It has poisoned progressive activism and allowed the state to tiptoe around religion and accommodate backward medieval demands, including the accommodation of Sharia principles in family laws. And I know that we'll talk about that a bit later on. What we're witness to is the rise of the, of the far-right religious and racist political movements everywhere that are growing in power and are mirroring each other. Whilst they appear as if they're opposed to each other, they can and do converge and overlap, particularly when it comes to maintaining the authenticity or purity or identity of culture and tradition. It would appear that what they have in common is the desire to suppress or eliminate altogether those ideas that seek to promote non-violence, empathy, compassion, and the value of all human life. In fact, this year is the 66th anniversary of the death of Gandhi at the hands of Nathuram Godse, a member of the RSS, which is the ultra-Hindu right-wing nationalist movement that is wedded to fascist ideology and committed to the creation of an intolerant and militarized Hindu nation in which there is no place for other minorities or indeed for tolerance itself. And along with others in the anti-communalist group Awaz, South All Black Sisters has opposed the rise of Hindu fundamentalism and Narendra Modi, the RSS-affiliated butcher of thousands of Muslims in Gujarat, uh, who in 2014, in the national elections, took control of power in India. The shift to Hindu fundamentalist governance has implications for those of us who are in the UK, who have fought against all forms of discrimination and injustice. In the UK recently, just this week, a debate has been raging amongst South Asian women's groups about whether or not to support an amendment to the serious crime bill that seeks to criminalize sex selection abortion. Sex selection abortion, or what is known as female feticide, is a practice involving the abortion of a fetus for no other reason than it's female. And it is one of the many forms of violence and discrimination faced by South Asian women. In countries like India, it is pervasive and has reached crisis proportions. In the UK, there is some anecdotal evidence to suggest that it has also taken place in South Asian communities. But there is no hard evidence of its extent. Um, and case studies produced by some of the women's group in favor of criminalization are hugely flawed in that they are cases of actually domestic violence. So what they've done is produce these cases uh, to show that, uh, to support the amendment to the bill and actually these cases show domestic violence and not sex, sex selection abortion. Um, the statistical evidence that is relied upon is actually comes from suspect quarters, including the right-wing anti-immigration tank, Migration Watch. So despite the lack of sound evidence, some women's groups are vociferously demanding the criminalization of sex selection abortion in the UK, although publicly they claim that they're not calling for criminalization but merely seeking a clarification of the existing law on abortion. 
This begs the question as to why the amendment is then necessary if it's just a clarification because you can do that through guidance. And why contain it within the serious crime bill itself? I suppose what's, um, and why not talk about the lack of specialist support services for BME women that has disappeared or under threat of closure, a problem that's really become acute now. And there's no corresponding demands for adequate funding for such services or for other ways of ensuring state protection from women who are coerced into sex selection abortion. I think, for example, it's possible to assess the risk of coercion to sex selection abortion through screening measures for domestic violence that are already in place for midwives and other health professionals in routine medical examinations, including that of pregnant women. But why we're really concerned is not that we are opposed to sex selection abortion, of course not, of course not, but because it is driven by the pro-life Christian right lobby with support from the Hindu, Sikh, and Muslim fundamentalist groups who claim to be moderates. These alliances are, of course, not new. Indeed, they're commonplace on the international stage where fundamentalists routinely come together on an anti-women's rights platform, anti-women's reproductive rights platform. Clearly, in the UK, the anti-immigration right and the religious right have formed an alliance to curtail women's reproductive rights in what can only be described as an instrumentalized manner. The issue of sex selection abortion is being hijacked by the anti-abortion religious lobbies seeking to limit the right of women to control their bodies and minds. The language of choice is being used to destroy the very right of choice. Such actions are yet another attempt by religious fundamentalists to roll back hard-won reproductive rights that black and white feminists have gained. Both racist and religious right groups are working hard, hand in hand often with other far-right political movements to shrink the democratic secular spaces that exist to the detriment of women and other minorities. What we see in the UK is a chameleon-like nature of religious fundamentalism in our communities particularly. Sometimes it masquerades as extremism and sometimes as moderates. But whatever the face of these dominant religious forces, they <coughs> seek to manipulate the idea of religious freedom for the purposes of carrying out wholesale assault on women's rights with the aim of reimposing a patriarchal sexual order seen to have disintegrated due to perceived Western sexually promiscuous lifestyles. So I think the stories that we should start with are the stories of the bravery and courage of countless civilians throughout the world who through a growing sense of injustice um, challenge and reject religious fundamentalism and refuse to underestimate it. They are the direct targets of criminality and genocide. Most of them are also the dispossessed and the alienated and they too have been subjected to lifelong marginalization and state abuse of power linked to corruption, criminality, cronyism, and neoliberal capitalism. It is said that only through solidarity can we defeat those who would use violence to silence free speech. But solidarity is hard to come by, especially for those of us who refuse to compromise on the struggle against any dram dramatic shift to state authoritarianism, or against religious fundamentalism, including Muslim fundamentalism across the globe. This conference hopefully will help us all to renew our commitment to multiple struggles <coughs> fought simultaneously, to reject the politics of hatred, annihilation, and violence, and to safeguard secular democratic spaces. We must do so without abdicating moral responsibility and in solidarity with those who dare to speak up for the ideals of secular democracy and all that goes with it. Thank you.